Music is India's beating heart. It keeps alive the soul of this young nation. It's everything from mainstream culture to regional folklore. This is not the story of popular music in India. It's about those unpopular few who rocked out in the face of adversity. My name is Arjun S. Ravi, and I'm one of the unpopular ones. As a former failed musician and a music journalist for over a decade, I've written about and covered our country's independent music scene. I've seen it grow from small beginnings to a legitimate industry that has festivals, tours, and even buses, bringing a new dimension to the sound of India. Through this series, you will see and hear hundreds of stories that fill up this untold chapter in India's history. This is the story of how we got here. Everything that had happened in the decades past had seemed as if it was leading up to something significant. Perhaps it would be the birth of our first true rock stars. While we weren't sure of what the definition of making it was for Indian rock, we at least wanted to be acknowledged by the broader public as not just losers with no hope and no possibilities. But in the 90s, a new feeling began to emerge within the scene. We were <coughs> standing by. For many, the first band to break on through was Indascreen. Most notably because they wrote and played their own music. Their story begins in 1985 when a bunch of college kids from Bombay formed a band called Rock Machine. They needed a vocalist and would soon be joined by a man who would go on to become one of Indian rock's most recognizable faces. I think I was in my, yeah, I was in my SYJC by then. And um, I saw a poster stuck on some electrical box or something with a very clever tagline on it saying, come roll on the grass at Cooperage. So I went to Cooperage grounds at Churchgate to see this band called Rock Machine. I remember Mark Selvin very clearly with his bass guitar and sort of moving all over the place, long hair, beard and everything else. And I remember this image also very, very clearly. This short guy standing on stage in one place with this Gibson Les Paul copy with the word Suzuki on it. So I don't know what, Gip <laughs> what this company was. And he was playing Time by Pink Floyd. And he was playing that Gilmore solo, note for note, bend for bend, but really beautifully. And I was thinking, wow, what a band. I just had an incredibly good time in that gig. I said, I love the energy of Rock Machine. I go with Rock Machine. And I thought, I decided that in my head at that time itself. Uh, They kind of blew me away because they were such a tight band. They were like, you know, synced with each other and they were almost like everybody playing in unison. They know what each one is doing, they know what they want to say and they were expressing stuff. I mean, I, I still remember just watching a Rock Machine show and actually promising myself that this is the way I'm going to be. Rock is not really our music. You know, we have adopted it. It's not our way of life. There are not too many people who are there as, as uh, role models. So, I mean, the role models would have had to be, you know, a, a Rock Machine or a, or a Gary Lawyer, Usha Uthamji, and, and uh, uh, you know, they were, they were really the, the, the flag bearers. They're a great band, you know, I'm saying they are, I've always thought they're a very good band. I find them very individually, very dedicated, they're very uh, lucky to have each other, you know, they're meant to be a band, which I respect, you know. It was an Indian version of what was going on internationally, right? So, it was not like, it was not bad. It was not like amazingly original, but you could have a much worse version of that. And I think that it was the fact that these guys were the first to do it. In 1988, the band released their first album, Rock and Roll Renegade. Cause I'm a rock and roll renegade. The album did particularly well, with some reports claiming over 10,000 copies sold. Rock Machine were regularly touring around the country and even abroad. In 1989, the government of India, at the behest of the then PM Rajiv Gandhi, sent the band along with other musicians on a tour of the Soviet Union. Gandhi wanted to present a picture of India that was different from the traditional Western outlook towards the country. And so, Rock Machine were chosen to go. 
So there was Louis Banks and Leslie Lewis and there was Rock Machine and Gary Lawyer and you know, all these acts suddenly on a, heading on a plane, on this Aeroflot plane. They served us caviar on the plane, man. It was the first time I ate caviar. It was a very nice experience. We had great response, you know, there was lots of, only thing is the public pretty much, much was straight jacketed, you know. I remember one of the shows where someone started dancing, a whole bunch of them started dancing, they were picked up by the cops and taken away. We have such a Timing was everything with them. Um, they were at a point in time where they were making great music. I think that was the basic, you know, crux of it. Uh, they happened to be at a time where technology was just coming into the fray. Uh, they were in Bombay, which was the hub of any activity. Video was just coming about. And all of this just came at the time when they were on their, on their scale up. Rock Machine had quickly risen to be one of the most popular alternative music artists in the country. And then MTV happened. By the late 1980s, India was in the middle of a financial slump. The then finance minister of the country, Manmohan Singh, was a proponent of opening up India's shores to multinational corporations, who were looking at the Indian middle class as a huge market to hawk their products to. And in 1991, India was finally liberalized and foreign brands and media began to enter the country once again. Prior to 1992, the amount of international music that Indians were exposed to on television was limited to Doordarshan broadcasts of shows like Top of the Pops and events like the Grammy Awards. A great divide existed between Indian music fans and Western pop and rock stars. When MTV came to India, it brought with it programming that, at the time and for a few years after, was a pop buffet for the international music-starved masses. Music videos only further fanned the flames of the music scene in India, giving musicians and fans greater access to their musical inspirations. Soon, a few Indian bands were making videos of their own, bands like Colorblind and Orange Street. MTV suddenly started acknowledging bands like us. Also, the, uh, the idea of a music video, I think that never happened to us before, you know, we, were, we had seen them on those pyramid curve videotapes and all that, but to have it at your home, you were exposed to that music suddenly at, at, you know, on, the, on your channel, and, you know, so it was pretty cool that way. I'd, I'd go to sleep watching MTV and I'd wake up and realize the TV was off and I'd turn it off and go back to sleep and I'd wake up in the morning and turn it back on. It was, it was as ubiquitous as that. And that became a whole new space for us, it became a whole new phase for us. Because music videos suddenly became something that became a part of our, our music making. By 1993, the band had got tired of the Rock Machine name and decided to rebrand themselves to emphasize not only a new beginning, but also a renewed vigor to reach higher peaks. Indus Creed was born, and soon, as if to re-emphasize their position as the country's biggest rock exports, the band won an MTV Asia Video Music Award. Their music videos for songs like Top of the Rock and Pretty Child are like time capsules from a bygone era, one where an Indian band was playing rock music in English on national television. That was the evolution for us in terms of how it went music video-wise. And we were feeling the impact of TV and this new liberalized uh, form, this new form of communication coming to India from satellite. And the, the impact that it was having on the band was very, very tangible and very palpable because at every stage we were getting more popular, better known, you know, there was, we could feel it. It was really interesting. When MTV came to India, that must have been quite an exciting thing. Oh, that was, that was like the ideal, you know. In fact, if I tell you about Nights on Fire coming on every two hours, literally, you could set your clock, you know, two o'clock, four o'clock, six o'clock, eight o'clock, ten o'clock. And that's how the song became so big here, you know. I mean, it just everybody knew about that song. It's just a question of frequency, you know, because you keep seeing it, you keep seeing it. You take a decent song and you play it, 10 million people hear the song, 9 million might hate it, a million like it, that's your hit, you know? I mean, literally, it's, the music is all about exposure. As far as the, like, impact, I think, for musicians, I don't, I think it did more for, like, the Indian pop scene than it did for the rock scene, right? Because there weren't too many bands that were sort of releasing 
videos at the time i mean you had that whole indie pop phenomenon that, that sort of grew out of it whether it was colonial cousins or alisha or sunita rao or baba sahegal of course remo the impact that mtv had on the music scene in india goes beyond just exposing indians to international music it even helped give birth to a brand new genre to be big as a brand you have to be first big with your own people and your own people speak hindi understand hindi they don't understand rock and they are not so familiar with english they like it they want to be that but it's aspirational it's not part of them and what is the most dominant music in the country it's actually uh, film music and then there's indie pop saw the development of a new form of east meets west music that wasn't related to the film industry this counter to the mainstream of indian music was just as popular as bollywood while it did not represent a wholly indie movement it made people expect an alternative to film music there was a time when alisha chennai and baba sagal were bigger than hollywood they were way more relevant they were way more popular dekhi hai saari duniya japan se leke russia none of the songs from that time that you know were part of movies if that lasted five more years i think we'd have a way different scene today and a lot of indie bands predate indie pop but they never rose to that much relevance or prominence except for rock machine yeah which also didn't really become alisha chennai alisha chennai could have a whole chorus in english and the masses accepted it yeah. and somehow english music by any other band didn't work music companies had already trapped themselves into this format of 4 and a half to 5 minute music videos and since everybody wanted to go music video music video way and make this popish video with uh, hardly any storyline and it was it had become an essential for any album to work a music video was essential music television was turning into reality tv the flood of really bad hindi pop the juggernaut of that was wiping out everything in its path everything that was of any value was being turned to crap aage aage ladki piche main utaya na duniya ka hi papa ho gaya hai deewana it's a great thing in a way that everybody can do videos and everybody can do an album but then too much of a good thing is also not too good you know because then the genuine guys get pushed out while the indie pop space was crowded by divas and crooners euphoria managed to make a name for themselves as a band that played pop music with a rock and roll heart their journey started a good decade before they hit the big time though with many disappointments lineup changes and frankly wtf moments on the way kaise bhulegi mera naam cha this was 88 89 and that's when as i said you know to impress the women euphoria was formed and euphoria had actually the same kind of setup like like uh, rock machine or or uh, or friends of shiva which was you know drums bass two guitars keyboards and one vocals it was always like that so that was uh, how it happened you know we had four songs they were all english songs so there's a very interesting story i must tell you i went to magna sound So he took our tape. He put it on one side of the, that double deck thing. So he put it on one side. On the other side, he put "It's Probably Me" by Eric Clapton's thing. He says, "See, see yourself, see." I'm sitting here thinking, "Kya bol raha hai yar? Wo Eric Clapton's thing hai, jisse LA ke kisi 64 channel mixer pe ye cheez banaya hai. We have gone to some studio in Okla on a four-track recorder. What are you saying, man?" After that you know my most interesting meeting was with a man called uh, Mr Pandit he heard the song and he says you know Palash they are very good songs but ye this is not me this is not my life you not talking about an indian you talking about an american this country wants to hear what is my problem and i kept on hearing him you know and at that time i was telling bro i was very angry i was like good good music aata nahi what do they know and what they know nothing man like this and i came back home and i thought yeah listen Uh, why am I being so uptight about singing my own mother tongue here? What's the problem? Will it make me a lesser person? Will it make me a lesser musician? 
am I ashamed of being an Indian? Maybe somewhere in my heart, maybe I was. And maybe I was thinking that, you know, if I sang in Hindi, it'll make me desi. But what I didn't realize is that, you know, that is what who I, that is who I am. I'm a brown-skinned man. So I think it, it really changed my thought process. And then we started making songs in Hindi, you know. And, and I, I, I will, I'll be eternally grateful to actually both those experiences, one at Magnus Sound and one at CBS Sony. I'll be eternally grateful. It was going to be a difficult road because, see, the thing is that the film guys, say, they all said that, you know, ye kya, you know, how can you do it? And the rock guys all said that, you know, this is a sellout. Everything changed for Euphoria with the release of their debut album in 1998. Dum. Dum. The album was released on a label called Archie's Music, a short-lived label set up by a company best known for greeting cards and cheesy commercials. The title track of the album is one of the most well-known songs of the indie pop era. The first concert we played after Dhoom came out was at LSR, where Indian Ocean opened for us. Oh, can you believe it? Yeah. So we entered behind the crowd. So you can imagine this, Arjun, about 5,000 people, they all turned around. And you know, the whole crowd started saying Dhoom, Pichak Dhoom, Pichak Dhoom. And I was like, guys, just enjoy this moment. I think what also worked in our favor, I really feel that our competition is not yet. See, the thing is, if Parikrama had got this idea, if Indian Ocean had got this idea, if anybody else had got this idea, we would not have reached here. I don't know about that. I'm telling you, Arjun, it's a fact that idea worked, you know. That here was an Indian rock band singing a Western melody in an Indian way. Nobody has did it. That's pretty much the template for Hindi rock that started becoming popular in the 90s. But Indian Ocean did it differently. They created a distinctly Indian sound that was hard-hitting. And while it took them many years to break through, their highlights reel worthy career is perhaps the independent music scene's most illustrious. Indian Ocean has always been a very sort of lost band. We were in our own world. We didn't know the others. We didn't have any interest. Who came out of Delhi? Who came out of Delhi? No idea. By the time I joined in 94, beginning, they had obviously done very few shows. I think the seven shows, maybe total in five years, they had done. But whatever, they were only playing their own music, so that was good. Not playing your own self-composition beyond a point is really frustrating. You have to be known for what you make and what you do in the field. Otherwise, you can't be a cover band. Because I know that if you're a cover band, you'll end up playing 31st Night gigs and in a hotel. <laughs> Indian Ocean is a Indian rock song. Because if you shut your eyes, we still sound different from a Western man. Some may argue that the only way for an Indian band to make it big is to make music for Bollywood. Indeed, Indian Ocean's big breakthrough came with Black Friday. A film about the 1993 bombings in Bombay. The soundtrack of the film was composed by Indian Ocean and the album contained one of the band's most recognizable songs. Black Friday was the first big Bollywood project that we, we did. Why did you agree to do that? We liked the story and it seemed nice. And we had already met Anurag Kashyap before. And we liked, I had seen Panch before. So those are the days when 
this underground filmmaker was coming up and we saw saw paanch and said wow it's about a band can you imagine who's making a film about a band and wo bhi maar maar raha hai logo ko ye sab sab kar raha hai to bada cool tha lag raha tha sara ka sara it was not a bollywood thing in the sense that there were no stars there were no this there were, you know none of these superstars and their tamjham and their families and their hangers on and that kind of crap that happens ki kudrat has padegi ha The film was effectively dead for four years, but because Bande was such a huge hit, and we were playing it all the time and being interviewed about it all the time and mentioning Anurag and the film everywhere, in our own little way, it kept some fire burning somewhere all the time. The Bande video came out two weeks before the release of the film, and this is the power of Bollywood. You know, that's when I realized that 15 साल Indian Ocean. और एक बॉलीवुड का गाना क्योंकि छपता है ना इतने बड़े बड़े जगहों में हर टीवी चैनल पे तो तुम्हारा रोटेशन हो रहा है ऐसे ऐसे लोग देख रहे हैं और सुन रहे तुम्हारा गाना जो तुम्हारा कंदीसा को कब भी नहीं जानते हैं और जानेंगे भी नहीं बिकॉज तुम कैसे दिखाओगे बंदे बिकेम अज हिट इन स्पाइट ऑफ द फिल्म नॉट गेटिंग रिलीज बॉलीवुड का पावर है और तुम इंडी होके जितना भी एंटी बॉलीवुड होना चाहो So how did indie bands who didn't want to be associated with Bollywood make it? How does the scene exist outside this all-encompassing mainstream behemoth? India never had its own rock magazine let alone a magazine dedicated to a niche but growing sub genre of a sub scene then in 1993 a young man working the night shift in his father's printing press in Allahabad decided to write up some articles and reviews on a beat up computer lay it out as a magazine and print up 2500 copies Amit Sehgal took these copies of the magazine he had just started a magazine he called the rock street journal and distributed them at college festivals in delhi he sent bundles of them to his friends around the country who gave them to their friends and so on soon he was receiving letters at home from readers who wanted more and this put rsj in motion rsj was formed the same year parkrama was formed yeah. in fact the release yeah. was uh, at our show in lsa You know that picture is still in front of me. We were playing in the day, and एक उस छोटे से टेबल में वो दोनों बैठे हुए थे व्हाइट कलर की आर्डर चेले के. तो मैंने क्या के क्या के बोला था कि हम अभी अनाउंस करेंगे. So we announced it four five times that you know go and buy it just for a baby. So I would always skip these international first five pages were just like some bizarre black metal stuff that I did not understand, did not want to understand. So I just I would skip to these stories where they'd be just doing these. very generic reviews of uh, festivals very first person driven i went to it was almost like a conversation but it told me about these other bands that existed and even though i was sitting in delhi my only sense of awareness about the community was that magazine the first edition of that uh, newsletter was completely liberating and i felt that he something is going to happen i was completely blown RSJ I think is a uh, one of the reasons why I can make a living doing what I do. I can do that today because someone like Amit Sehgal had the guts to or the passion rather to do what he did. His dad owned printing presses and had a lot of property in Allahabad and he's the only son and he said jao beta tumhe jo karna karo. But that still doesn't take away from the struggle because there's a lot of frustration. Money is not the only thing, right? You're also being told to fuck off at every given turn by everybody. Like you're going to a distributor saying, "Main aapko magazine print karke de raha hu, aap apne stall pe laga denge." Wo keh raha hai, "Fuck off, yar." Kya hai yaar aaj wale? Jab mummy pe magazine maar raha hai, tumhare dawa ho jaye aaj. It's just ridiculous, ridicule at every given milestone, but you just keep plowing along. Amit was into it for RSJ. Like he was running that as a business. Uh, he had, you know, the number of people. It was a magazine. 
they had a thought process as to what do they want to do with it. He was studying international magazines, he was traveling, you know, he was learning and then he was educating. So for me, that was, again, uh, it was one of those uh, milestones or rather one of the cornerstones uh, like the advent of technology, whether it be internet or whether it be uh, recording or whether it be radio, like RSJ was one of those things that literally significantly brought stuff together. Amit Saigal wanted to promote bands playing original music. This at a time when most bands were famed for playing note-perfect covers of international bands. His Great Indian Rock Festival, started in 1997, put bands from around the country on stage at the Hamsadwani Amphitheatre in Delhi. and soon became one of the most sought-after opportunities for Indian bands to play. RSJ would also release a GIR compilation album featuring original music of Indian bands from around the country. Many bands began composing their own music with the sole intention of getting to be on the GIR compilation. It was very straightforward when you think about it. Why were bands not writing stuff? Because there was no incentive. Suddenly he created incentive. He created the GIR platform which became an incentive for that. He used to tell everyone to original music to or music and to to prove his point only he then came up with the GIR one tape and the entire concept. And that moment is like crystallized in my memory. Just sitting in my car with like much excitement while like some magazine while I bought this thing and ripping the plastic open I'm sticking this tape into my like cassette deck in my in my car. And then this music starts playing and this feeling of knowing this is ours. It was extremely also inspiring, like, okay, so now I can do this thing. Now suddenly there's this avenue and pride. I mean, it was great, lots of pride. And I'm like, wow, these are just like, you know, brown people like us trying to do white music. Wow, you have your own song being played. You know, that doesn't happen, you know. How else do you get out there? And that, that this is like pre MySpace era of yeah, everything, you know. Yeah. yeah. Like, CD distribution through a magazine was the only way yep. you could get heard. That was epic. There was nothing else. Yeah. Amit Segal, lovingly called Papa Rock, was one of the most loved figures in the Indian rock scene. His untimely death in 2012 took from the scene a generous, large-hearted man who was sorely missed. What he's done for Indian music, for rock music, single-handed, no money, no big, you know, there's no corporate support. Like, you know, at least now OML is getting that support. But in those days, he was struggling to put those gigs on stage, but he did it. And he was just this completely passionate, full heart guy. It was just one big heart, and uh, he would be driven by that. Whatever he wanted to do was completely based on what he felt needs to be done. It's right, it's wrong, I'll make money, I'll lose money, whatever the hell, no, I. this has to be done, and I have to do it. Am I feeling what I should feel? Or is it just something unreal? I always saw him as this friendly, generous, big-hearted guy. People could come into his house, stay anytime. You know, when you talk about kind of also the history of Indian rock, there is a couple of houses, which I think it's like the, you know, it's, if you compare it to the ancient Indian, it's like the fort. Uh, you know, you had Amit's house at Horskar's enclave, you had Sandy's house, you had Jayashree's house. These were the places which every band would just come and stay there because it was free accommodation and free food. I would probably put Amit Saigal as the number one like influence on the indie scene today because what he created was the the foundation you know when people tell me oh you're whatever this of metal I, I i don't really accept that because i wouldn't be here if it wasn't for people like him and farad wadia who kick started a revolution in, in the country almost you know amit uh, thank you i will probably solely attitude to changing the mindset of bands like us then and which, of course, pa passed on to the younger generation as well. And what I also liked about him was that we used to really look up to him, right? Like that guy who started Indian, like gave Indian rock legitimacy and all of that, these tags. 
he was he didn't have a competitive bone in him. He was always very appreciative of whatever was happening. I remember the one of the last times when we had chilled, he, we were both slightly drunk and we were standing somewhere and he put his arm around me and he was like, man, this music scene's going to grow bigger, show me. He's like, and this is what it was supposed to be. He's like, you know, all this petty jealousy. He was like, yeah, it's going to happen. There will be a lot of shows, a lot of losses, but you will learn to survive and you will figure out at around the same time as RSJ was taking off in Allahabad and Delhi, another DIY initiative was taking off in Bangalore. In the 90s, Bangalore was still a fairly laid-back town. Not yet the software and IT hub and fast-paced metropolis it has now become. It was also known for its vibrant pub culture, which further helped popularize rock music in the city. In 1997, to celebrate 50 years of India's independence, Gopal Navale and a few friends decided to host an open jam, inviting local musicians from the city to come and jam in the name of freedom and independence and a MTV. Hey, musicians brought their own amps. This is the 50th year of freedom. There's a hype of it, no? because of the 50th year of freedom. So the musicians could celebrate with me playing music. MTV was just born. So they, they, uh, they came and covered the event. So it was like, well, Hey, you can be an MTV if you play in Freedom Jam. So Gopal has this Jeep, I know, I think he had it until recently, but this open top Jeep, really cool, with this battery that could run a guitar amp. I would stand up on the open top Jeep, plug in my guitar, we'd stop somewhere in Imjur and I'd just play <laughs> guitar. And people would gather like, what the hell is going on? And then before the cops come, you'd give all these pamphlets out and like, okay, Freedom Jam, Freedom Jam, and go, next place. Brigade Road, stop, play. It was kind of ridiculous. Freedom Jam was a super fun affair because nobody remembers what happened. Because it went on all night. You were, you were in different states of being trashed. Freedom Jam became huge. At one point, it moved out of the club. It went into a farmhouse in Nelmangla where it went on all night. Gopal's farmhouse. Gopal's farmhouse. Mental that was. First year, there was 500 people only. Next year, there was 1,000 people. The next year, there were 5,000 people. And the next year, there were cops. Cops came uh, at 3 o'clock in the morning. There was a lati charge in my farm. A peaceful place. There was Indian classical music happening. And up till now, I never had any sponsors. The sound guys would come and give me sound free. The bands will play free. But after the cops came and broke it up, we got into the headlines. Once this happened, I got calls from sponsors. The annual Freedom Jams also kick-started the Sunday Jam, a monthly open jam where any amateur musicians could come and get an audience. Many Bangalore bands like Lounge Pirana, Galij Gurus and Kryptos credit their formation to the Sunday Jam. It was strange to know that like things like this were happening here in India. Or, like Everything is like happening somewhere else. Nothing happens here. You get tapes from outside, you get cassettes from, everything is from outside. So coming to a place and like people are like moving around, there are bands and things like this. I was like quite, it, it was a huge thing for me. Thermal also um, just decided to register for that and, and it was a really special gig for me because we got a phenomenal response. I think that was one of the gigs that uh, uh, gave us a lot of encouragement because it wasn't just the music kind of people there. It was a big mix of people. Also, and, the fact yeah. that it was completely uncurated. Anybody yeah. could go. There yeah. was no, uh, there was no entry in sense of you had to play this good or you had to have yeah. been a band for this long. Anybody. They would do, um, you know, on Independence Day, they would do this concert, and it's bringing it to the limelight and to the to the forefront that we are Indian. Don't don't treat us as some. Uh, foreign minority community over here kind of a thing. Don't, we are essentially the same, it's just that it's in English, it's a different set of uh, instruments. You know, and, and it was very frustrating at one point, seeing all of this Bollywood stuff that's going on, which is so much Western, the way they portray women, the clothes they wear. Here we are, these bunch of ugly guys, just playing some guitars and singing some songs, and we are just, you know, constantly made to feel that you're not uh, part of this place. It's in the 90s that we truly began standing by. The country had opened up and we could finally begin to see heights far greater than what we had previously imagined. The tide from covers to original music too was slowly turning. And in the coming decades, the scene would have a host of new independent heroes to look up to. Am I feeling what I should feel? 
Set the red on. 